Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we will be watching Sengoku Jidai Part 1, The Battle of Okehazama by Extra History. Yes, as promised, we are now beginning Extra History series on the Sengoku Jidai. Now, we touched on this while watching the series on Admiral Yi. To my understanding, this period of time is basically a build-up to that Japanese invasion of Korea, and so we'll get a lot of background on what we saw in the Admiral Yi series, and we'll also get a lot of information on Japan during this time period. Now, once again, I do not know much about Japanese history, so this series will be more about learning as I go, and hopefully you guys can assist with that. In the Admiral Yi series, you left a lot of great comments down below, educating me on things I otherwise didn't know. So let's do the same thing this time. Anyway... I'm excited to jump into this series. If you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below, and will give you access to exclusive content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. Sengoku Jidai, the Warring States period. The mm. time we think of when we think of samurai. A time of self-sacrifice, bravery, treachery, and betrayal. A time when the fate of great clans could turn in a day, and peasants could rise up to become regent of all Japan. Yes, I don't know much about this period, but what I do know is that it is a very iconic period of Japanese history. Like they say, when we think of, in popular culture, the idea of the samurai, you know, these battles... This is basically the time period we're thinking of, though, to my understanding, you know, sort of what many people think of when they think of the samurai and all that kind of stuff isn't necessarily accurate, or at least there's a lot of inaccuracies to it. So I'm trying to come in without too many assumptions. I'm ready to learn sort of from the base up. A time filled with personalities like Miyamoto Musashi, Oda Nobunaga, Hattori Hanzo, and of course, Tokugawa Ieyasu. Names mm. that live on in our culture even today. It's one of the most seminal periods in Japanese history, and it'll be the topic of our next few videos. In 1467, a few decades before Columbus stumbled onto the shores of the Bahamas, and 15 mm. years after the light of Rome was extinguished for the last time at the fall of yep. Constantinople. What a time in history, huh? <laughs> the Roman Empire has just truly fallen. And by the Roman Empire, I'm talking, of course, about the Byzantine Empire, Sure, some people will tell you that the Byzantine Empire wasn't actually the Roman Empire. That's not true. It was. You have the fall of the Byzantine Empire, and we're coming up on the age of exploration, an era of history that was truly influential around the world. And then we have this era in Japan. So much going on. <laughs> Japan erupted into a great civil war. This war, the Onin War, rocked all of Japan. It started as a dynastic dispute between two great clans, the Hosokawa and the Yamana, but it soon spiraled out of their control, devastating both of these clans and shattering any semblance of unity within Japan. As mm. central authority collapsed, regional warlords called daimyo fought to assert their power over whatever portion of the country they could grab, fracturing Japan into a hundred feuding fiefdoms. Yeah, and I mean, to my understanding, this is what the Sengoku Jidai basically is. I mean, the Warring States period, right? It's when basically any semblance of centralized control fell apart and Japan became a bunch of bickering warlords, states, warriors, you know, just an intense period of civil conflict and civil war that lasted for quite a while, to my understanding. And plunging the whole country into chaos and a hundred years of ceaseless wow. war. Wow. But yeah. we're going to pick up the story in the province of Mikawa, the home of the Matsudaira, in 1548. This province and this whole region is central to our story, because Kyoto, the capital of Japan mm. at the time, and traditionally the home of the emperor and the shogun, is just a short distance away. And whoever controls the shogun, at least in theory, controls Japan. Right. But in Mikawa, the Matsudaira are surrounded by two larger, much more powerful clans, the Oda to the west and the Imigawa to the east. It was just a matter of time until one of these larger clans attacked the Matsudaira, looking to claim their territory in this age of might makes right. 1548 is that year. The Oda forces start marching into Matsudaira territory. The defenses collapse. Without help, the Matsudaira are clearly lost, so the head of the Matsudaira clan turns to the Imigawa. 
He asks them for an alliance, for help to defend his lands. But an alliance won't come without hmm. a price. Uh -oh. The Imagawa clan- And I wonder how Japan was up until this point. I mean, clearly central authority can have been strong even at the beginning of this period if it's so up for grabs, right? Uh, and like I said, I don't know much about Japanese history, so maybe some of you can let me know what the period before this era was like. You know, if there had been strong central authority at some point, had it fallen apart? Had there never been that in Japan? Because I really don't know. I mean, if we look sort of at world history, if you have a system of strong central control that then falls apart, well, uh, it's pretty common to enter into a period of civil strife, civil war. I mean, you can think about, say, the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. What happened afterwards? Well, you have a bunch of warring tribes, kingdoms, peoples, moving across Europe, fighting each other, absolute chaos, and Japan is about to fall into uh, about or even more than a hundred years of absolute chaos. And offer to help on the condition that he send them his eldest son as a hostage. Having a little other choice, the head of the Matsudaira family agrees. But as his retainers are taking his son to the Imagawa territory, they're ambushed. Somebody tipped off the Oda. The boy is kidnapped and spirited away to Oda lands. Wow. The Oda write to the Matsudaira and tell them that if they don't turn traitor and end their alliance with the Imagawa, they'll kill the boy. And here's where the head of the Matsudaira pulls one of the most brilliant maneuvers of the Sengoku Jidai. Now, I don't know if he did it as a brilliant stratagem or if he was just doing it out of stoic samurai bravado, but still, mm. brilliant. He writes back and says to them something roughly like, Kill my son. In doing so, you will show the Imagawa just how committed to our alliance I am. Wow. Catch-22. Don't kill my <laughs> son, I win. Kill my son, I win more. Yeah, <laughs> how about that? He's saying, look, I mean, he's basically showing them his strength. And he's going very far by saying, I don't care if you kill my son. Uh, of course, most people would not be willing to do that. But in doing that, he's saying, fine, do whatever you want. I win either way. <laughs> I suppose that's a uh, pretty brilliant political maneuver. Though, personally, I'm not sure how the son would feel in that situation. Probably not too happy. And boy, does it work. The Oda don't kill the boy. In fact, they have no idea what to do with him now. Hmm. So he just sits around at a local temple. Yeah, well, a captive isn't much value if you're trying to hold them hostage or ransom them, and the person who's supposed to be paying the ransom or agreeing to some deal says, I don't care, do with them what you please. I mean, this is the whole point, usually, of taking a hostage. You can extract some sort of value out of their family or their clan or their allies. And if their clan says, whatever, don't care, then you're kind of screwed. For several years. Thus, in a world where hostages are slaughtered left and right, this boy is left unharmed until, at last, wow. an opportunity comes for the Oda to get what little use out of him they can. The old head of the Oda has died, and the Oda forces are in a bit of disarray. The Imagawa see their opportunity and put to siege the castle that houses the new head of the Oda clan while he's relatively undefended. Mm. Then they offer the Oda a deal. We'll let you live if you hand over the castle we're sieging and give us back the Matsudaira boy you stole from us years ago. The Oda jump at the deal because, hey, good riddance. <laughs> the head of the Matsudaira clan has also just recently died, making this boy, in name at least, the new head of the clan. The Imagawa see having him as a hostage as a good way of assuring that the Matsudaira will remain on their side. And with any luck, they can raise him to be a staunch ally of the Imagawa by the time he returns home at the age of 15. Mm. In 1556, the boy is now officially a man by the standards of the time, and he returns to Mikawa to rule the province in his own right. The alliance with the Imagawa is going well. The Oda are feeling the pressure of the combined forces of the Matsudaira and the Imagawa, and now it is time for this teenage daimyo to take up the sword himself and lead the Matsudaira forces. His capacity for war is quickly confirmed as he storms through Oda lands, reducing the hill forts along the border. But even as his armies are raising the Matsudaira flag over these fortified hills, the Imagawa forces are doing even better, cutting deep swaths into the Oda lands. The wow. end is near. The, the end is near. And you know, this practice of taking captives, hostages, has been common throughout history. Uh, in this case, we're talking about warring clans, but you can even zoom out. This is a practice that's been common amongst warring states, different kingdoms and countries. You know, two countries at war with each other. If one country gains the upper hand over another, they might take, say, the crown prince as a hostage, raise him in their country, and then send him back. You know, I think of, say, the man who will 
grow to be known as Vlad the Impaler and the Ottoman Turks. That was the situation that happened between them. So this, once again, has been a common practice. Of course, it's sort of unique here because we're not necessarily talking about a bunch of warring countries, uh, at least not at this point. We're talking about warring clans controlling different territories. Though I guess that might just be a more zoomed-in version of the same concept. The Imagawa forces are going to march on to the final Great Oda Castle, destroy their last major rival, and sweep on to take Kyoto, with mm. the loyal Matsudaira at their side. The Imagawa forces are resting in a gorge, partying, celebrating, and regathering their strength for the final siege of this castle. The Matsudaira forces are camped a bit further off at one of the border forts they've recently taken. Meanwhile, the last of the Oda forces are in their castle. They are preparing for one last desperate defense, but their leader, the 26-year-old Oda Nobunaga, has other plans. His advisors counsel him to hide in the castle, or perhaps to surrender without a fight, but he turns to them and he says, Do you really want to spend your entire lives praying for longevity? We were born in order to die. Whoever's <laughs> with me, come to the battlefield tomorrow morning. Whoever's not, just stay wherever you are and watch me win it. <laughs> he knows that all defending the castle will do is buy him maybe a few more days, but he has no interest in losing more slowly. He'd rather take the thousand to one shot at victory. So he gathers up the few hundred men he has in his castle and begins riding toward the Imagawa force, an army right. that numbers in the tens of thousands. He rallies men to his banner as he winds through the countryside, mustering a force of about 2,500 souls not afraid to die on this. I mean, still not nearly enough, but considering where you started, clearly sort of an inspiring and charismatic leader, riding through, gathering men as he goes, that's exactly what you need in this situation. Will it be enough? Uh, you're still in a real bad spot. This suicide charge he's proposing. But his yeah. information network is still good, and he knows that the Imagawa forces are resting in a gorge. What's more, it's a gorge he knows well from when he was a boy. He has a plan. It may be a desperate one, perhaps even a foolhardy one, but it is a plan. He has no intention of charging onto the spears of his enemies just to die with glory. When they near the gorge where his enemies are resting, Oda Nobunaga does something that seems like madness with his force of 2,500 facing up against an army of 25,000. He splits up his men. But he's playing to win here, mm. and he knows that he's only got one shot. So he sends a division of 500 men up to a fortified temple on a nearby hill. These 500 men are not there to fight, but rather to create a decoy army. They take flags and banners and litter them atop the hill so that the men in the gorge think that Nobunaga's entire force has taken up a defensive position there. I mean, look, uh, I would typically say that it's a bad idea to split such a small force when you're so greatly outnumbered. But then again, when you're outnumbered this badly, <laughs> any sort of attempt at victory is a shot in the dark, a miracle of sorts. And so if you have some crazy plan that you think could possibly work, well, honestly, you're probably better off trying that than keeping your men together and trying some sort of assault or basic surprise attack. You know, if you think you can do something clever, considering how badly you're outnumbered, I would say just go for it. You don't have much of a chance in the first place, and this might be your chance to win. Hardly a threat for them to worry about. After all, it's just one more hill fort to take. But Oda Nobunaga has another plan. He knows how to sneak around the gorge and enter Ooh. it from a place that Imagawa will never suspect. As he begins to lead his forces around their stealthy path, a storm rolls in. The rain begins to pour. The clouds and the water whipping through the wind mask his approach. No one in the gorge sees them until it's too late. The men in the gorge have been drinking. Ooh. Some are intense. Many have dispersed to find shelter from the rain. And then, just as the... Classic combo. Small force, greatly outnumbered, springs upon the enemy, who has been drinking, is a little tipsy, not ready, and, well, it usually goes much better than you would expect for the small force, given how greatly outnumbered there are. I mean, there are many examples of this throughout history. You can think of uh, George Washington uh, leading his troops into New Jersey across the Delaware to find the tipsy Hessians. You know, many different examples. A smaller force, surprising. Um, a bigger force that may be a little tipsy just basically isn't ready for them. You know, you can't underestimate that element of surprise. Clouds part and the rain stops. Oda Nobunaga's men come charging into the valley. It's mayhem. It's a slaughter. The unprepared and drunken men scatter or fall where they stand. 
The attack is so sudden that the lord of the Imigawa doesn't even realize it's an attack. He thinks it's just a ruckus caused by the peasants and his army, so he wow. doesn't move from the play he's watching until a soldier bursts into his tent. At first he thinks it's one of his men, but the soldier thrusts a spear at him. He whips out his katana at the last moment and slices the spear in two, but too late. Another man rushes in and lops off his head. Wow. With that, with such surprise and such panic, with the complete loss of their leadership, the Imigawa army evaporates. Thousands Man. are cut down as they flee. Thousands more just quietly return to their farms back in the Imigawa lands. But this force was everything. The Imigawa thought they were going all the way to Kyoto with this army, so they brought everything they had. They went all in. They said, all right, this is the time. We're going to do it. Send everybody. And uh, now I imagine they're in big, big trouble. And I do wonder, say that Imagawa army, um, tens of thousands of men, what was the composition of that force like? I mean, you know, we think about sort of the armored, skilled samurai, but of course, a force that big, the vast majority, must have been regular foot soldiers. And so... Were they levies? Were they peasant farmers who had been uh, living in Imagawa territory or had some allegiance to the clan and were called up to fight? You know, what exactly was the setup there? Uh, maybe some of you can answer down below because I'm curious. The weakened Imagawa are now just carrion for their hungry neighbors. All of those clans around them descend on their land and carve it up between them. Even one of their former allies. <laughs> the young leader of the Matsudaira understood which way the wind was blowing. As he watched the routing Imagawa forces stream past his captured hill fort, he decided that it was time to meet with the young lord of the Oda. Oda Nobunaga, perhaps due to his own lack of forces, or perhaps due to the Matsudaira boy's nearly mythical ability to dodge death, agreed to work with him rather than slaughter his forces outright, as was often done to the losing side during the Sengoku Jidai. The young Matsudaira leader agreed to be not perhaps a vassal, but more a junior partner in wherever Nobunaga's adventures may lead him. This young man who will one day be known far and wide, Tokugawa Ieyasu. Join mm. us for the next episode as... Yeah, they saved the name drop for the end, but I'm not familiar with the guy, so... <laughs> the name drop didn't necessarily have the weight that I'm sure it had with a lot of you. Oda Nobunaga begins to formulate his own plans to march on Kyoto, and this young man transforms the Matsudaira into the formidable Tokugawa clan. Oh, and if you want some more cool samurai facts, check out this video from our friends at All Time Numbers. Alrighty, looks like that is the end of this first episode. Um, you know, when you're dropped into something like this, it can be a little disorientating. You know, there's a lot of names I've never heard, all this stuff being thrown at me, but I'm enjoying this series so far. I'm trying to learn as I go. That's the whole point of doing this. You know, I said before even the Admiral Yi series that I've been wanting to fill in some of the gaps in my historical knowledge, uh, and one of those big gaps is... Well, a lot of gaps, but one of them is Asian history as a whole, and East Asian history in this case. So we started with a bit of Korean history, now we're doing a bit of Japanese history. Um, so that's the point of this, you know? Uh, I'm trying to learn a little bit more about the world <laughs> as we go throughout these reactions. And it's been a good time so far. Um, I think this is going to be a very dramatic, entertaining series. Uh, seems like... There's going to be a lot happening, a lot of betrayals, fighting back and forth, last stands, charges, you know, all the stuff that makes for sort of a great military history, right? So yeah, uh, I had a good time with this one. I thought it was very interesting. I'm also just interested, once again, to see how this period broadly plays out, to see how it sort of leads up to the Imjin War. Uh, the Japanese invasions of Korea, because now that's something that we do know a bit about after the Admiral Yi series, how this sort of sets up Japan for the future even after that. Um, a lot of real interesting questions I still have. This is the first episode. Had a good time with this one. If you guys enjoyed it, please leave a like, subscribe, you know, all that good stuff. Please leave a comment. You know, I always love seeing comments from people who know more about these topics than I do. Um, you guys do a great job of filling in my questions, giving me more information. Uh, so thank you once again for all the great comments. Anyway, I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.